people can realize their sexual and reproductive health and rights. We at the UN Foundation are honored to be co-hosting this event with the World Benchmarking Alliance, an organization committed to public accountability on corporate performance on key elements of the Sustainable Development Goals. So let me turn to our purpose for today. The World Benchmarking Alliance will be presenting a baseline report on their groundbreaking gender equality benchmark, which will shine a light on how top global apparel companies are or are not driving gender equality throughout their global supply chains. The UN Foundation in turn will be sharing progress on corporate action under our private sector action for women's health and empowerment initiative. This includes five new business commitments. And we'll hear from women workers and discuss with civil society leaders what's really making impact and how to ensure that the priorities of women workers themselves are driving company action. And you'll likely hear a few key themes emerge. First, that public commitments need to be paired with transparency and accountability for companies to meaningfully play their role on the sustainable development goals and on women's health and empowerment. Second, that to make visible the invisible roles and lives and dignity of the tens of millions of women employed in global supply chains, companies need to listen to and center their center chain. Third, that the pandemic has only amplified the importance of gender equity to business and resilience in the long term. And those leading the way are changing their core business models to meet this expectation. We are beginning to see this in the companies that are standing by their commitments to the UN Foundation. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said in his opening address of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly last week, recovery is our chance to reimagine economies and societies. So in that spirit, we hope that this meeting will contribute to such a reimagining, especially the role of the private sector. And we would like to engage the wisdom of all of you tuning in today. So as we kick off today's session, I'd like to invite you to share your thoughts in the chat box and during the question and answer session. What do you think needs to be done to achieve gender equality and women's health and rights in global supply chains? And what actions are you taking? But before we get started, a couple of logistical items. You are welcome to turn on your video, but please stay on mute and keep your microphone off. Please actively participate through the chat function and make sure you send your messages to everyone, not to any of the panelists privately. We recommend viewing the event on speaker view and then at the end when we get to the question and answer session switching to gallery view. You can change the view at the top right hand corner of your screen. And last, we will be recording this session. So please note that everything will be on the record. So now I'm pleased to introduce Ambassador Tom Woodruff from the permanent mission of the United Kingdom to the UN. He is the Minister Counselor for Humanitarian, Peace Building and Development Issues and the UK's Ambassador to the Economic and Social Council. It's particularly fitting the UK is joining us today. The UK is the co-chair of the Group of Champions for Women's Economic Empowerment at the United Nations, where it is a reliable leader and partner on gender equality, sexual and reproductive health and rights, the rights of girls, and of course, the sustainable development goals. And we appreciate that the UK has a track record of partnering with civil society in advancing these issues. As many of you know, this year is the 25th anniversary of the Beijing World Conference on Women still the highest global bar we have on gender equity and women's rights. The U UN will convene a special session to honor this two days from now. So we are delighted to have a UN member state official who will unapologetically support an equity agenda as we build forward. So with that, it's my privilege to turn the floor to Ambassador Tom Woodruff for five minutes of opening remarks. Ambassador, welcome, and you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Seema, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very grateful. It was, a, it was very nice indeed. And I just want to say good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us, wherever you may be. Um, and just to say how very 
pleased I am to be here and very honoured to have been invited to speak this morning and of course to say thank you to the World Benchmarking Alliance and the UN Foundation uh, for hosting this really important event on driving corporate commitments on gender equality and women's health. So today's conversation, uh, which focuses on the intersection of gender, corporate action and the SDGs, could not come at a more crucial time. We, all of us, are only too aware of the devastating impact of COVID-19, which has brought significant human loss, huge shocks to our economies and healthcare services, and will substantially reverse recent development gains. So the WBA Gender Baseline Report and the UN Foundation's Corporate Commitments Progress Report provide crucial insight into how we should and must frame our response, as Seema said earlier on and to focus on reducing inequality, supporting the most vulnerable and empowering women and girls. And the Gender Baseline Report is part of the WBA's broad work in measuring and incentivizing business impact. Their benchmarks are a valuable tool in shaping the decisions of companies, shareholders and consumers alike by revealing important data on women's employment and conditions, including on representation, health, compensation, violence and harassment, community and governance. And this work is even more important and necessary now than it ever has been. We've all seen and we've all heard how COVID-19 has exacerbated gender inequality, becoming a shadow pandemic that puts women and girls at real and significant risk. Gender gaps are widening and some countries are using the pandemic as an excuse to roll back women's rights. Women in turn are the hardest hit by the economic fallout from the pandemic. Now, again, as Seema was just saying, there is a lot of current talk and there is a lot of talk here at the UN about the need to build back better from COVID-19. But for this really to be better, we must all work to make sure that women and girls are at the heart of these efforts in their design, their impact and their implementation. None of us want one of the lasting legacies of COVID to be a reversal of hard won progress on gender inequality. So one of the ways to prevent this, and as we will, I think, hear later today, is the critical importance of companies firstly incorporating a gender strategy in their work and then ensuring that it applies across the entire supply chain. And that's why the UK has recently launched the Vulnerable Supply Chains Facility, which helps strengthen global supply chains by supporting workers in developing countries during the pandemic. And in the garment sector, interventions are tailored to meet the needs of women through health awareness, gender-based violence programming, and efforts in ensuring a safe and sustainable future. And the UK government is also engaging with business on a gender inclusive COVID recovery through its development finance institution or our development finance institution, the CDC. The CDC has committed to a gender sensitive response to COVID-19 and has provided a practical set of recommendations for investors and intermediaries. And it has also launched a gender strategy actively promoting opportunities for women's economic empowerment. However, action alone is not enough. Decisions made at the governmental, civil society and corporate level must be measured and evaluated. They must respond to the most urgent need and be informed by the realities on the ground. This is often a crucial missing piece and it is this piece that initiatives such as the WBA can help provide. Data on women in global value change is often insufficient, rendering women workers invisible in their companies. This prevents women from fully contributing to and benefiting from productive work. And companies in turn are inhibited from making informed business decisions about their supply chains and are unable to understand and realize the full benefits of women's employment. Benchmarks therefore play a key role in not only illustrating the social and environmental impact of business, but also holding them publicly accountable. And they help us understand women's roles in value, change, value chains and can act as an essential first step towards preventing abuse. So I'm really pleased to say that the UK has been an instrumental partner in the WBA, WBA since its inception. And for all the reasons I've just described, I'm delighted that we have provided over a million dollars to the WBA since it was founded in September 2018 to support its critical work. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here today to continue our support through this event and to partner with the WBA, WBA and UN Foundation to continue to urge greater corporate action on gender equality and the SDGs. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that follows. Uh, with apologies, I am gonna to have to slip away a little bit early, but I will stay for as long as I possibly can. Thank you very much, Seema.
Thank you so much, Ambassador Woodruff. And we understand how busy your schedule is, given that it is the UN General Assembly. But we are so appreciative that you were able to open our discussion today and showcase what it's like to have a supportive government of these issues. So thank you for all that you and the UK are doing. With that, it is now my honor to introduce Shamista Salvaratnam, who is the interim, interim gender benchmark lead for the World Benchmarking Alliance. And she will take us through WBA's groundbreaking gender baseline report. And over to you, Sham. Thank you very much, Seema. The World Benchmarking Alliance is delighted to present its gender baseline report, which assesses the actions that the world's 36 most influential apparel companies are taking to address gender inequalities and empower women. WBA is a multi-stakeholder alliance. Our work and vision have always centered around the SDGs. We bring together a diverse set of actors to incentivize the private sector to meet the SDGs. And we hold companies to account in how they do so. We do this by measuring the performance of the 2000 most influential companies globally. These are the companies that can lead and enable systems change around the world. Our social transformation aims to transform the role of business in society such that businesses respect human rights, promote equality and empower people to ensure that no one is left behind. And as part of that transformation, our gender benchmark aims to accelerate corporate progress in closing the gender gap. Simply put, there can be no sustainable development without gender equality. In reality, however, gender inequalities are pervasive globally. Women are underrepresented in leadership positions. They are paid less than their male colleagues. They participate less in the labor force and spend more time on unpaid care and domestic work. They face sexual harassment and gender-based violence and they receive limited support for their health needs. And these inequalities have only been deepened further by the COVID pandemic, widening the gender gap even more. Yet, the business case is clear. Advancing gender equality has the potential to increase global growth by $13 trillion by 2030, and failing to do so has the ability to lower global growth by $1 trillion. A middle path, taking action only after the pandemic has subsided, would boost the economy but reduce the potential opportunity by more than $5 trillion. At WBA, we believe that companies are uniquely positioned to drive gender equality and women's empowerment across their entire value chain and our gender benchmark methodology provides the roadmap for companies to do so. Our gender baseline report uses publicly available information to assess 36 apparel companies on how they promote and drive gender equality and women's empowerment in order to determine progress on SDG 5 and beyond. The pandemic has had a significant impact on the apparel industry with significant revenue losses, store and office closures, halted production at garment factories, furloughs and risk management among supply chain workers. As a result, the industry has had to refocus and therefore at WBA, we decided to take a phased approach and not publish a full benchmark with a ranking this year but rather to publish a report to shed light on the reality of corporate gender impact in the industry and map out current actions and good practices so that progress can be made in closing the gender gap. The stories of inequalities experienced by the women behind the labels are countless. Take the story of Roja, a married woman in her thirties working in the cutting division of a factory in Mysore, India. She described how her supervisor stalked her and repeatedly called her cell phone after work hours, asking for sexual favours, promising that he would give her a lighter workload and sanction time off whenever she wanted. When she complained to the factory's administration, they said that he was a supervisor who had high productivity and told her such harassment was normal and that she needed to take it in her stride. It's stories like Rojas that need to be heard in order to drive change within the apparel industry. From our research, we have gained numerous insights into the extent to which the apparel sector is taking action to address gender inequalities and empower women. And some strong messages have emerged. We have learned that firstly, gender data is invisible. Companies are disclosing less than 40% of the information that stakeholders expect to see, both in terms of quality and quantity of information shared. Moreover, nearly 90% of the companies assess 
disclosed less than 30%. This lack of transparency is hindering progress towards the SDGs. We have found that there is a lack of gender disaggregated data disclosed by companies. And this holds true across a number of metrics. For example, only seven companies assessed report on the gender balance of their workforce across five levels, from board members and senior executives to senior and middle management, as well as overall workforce. Only two companies disclose information showing, how they showing that they track how many women employees participate in professional development programs that offer specific support in their career progression, such as mentoring programs and leadership coaching. And in the supply chain, no company publishes the number of women compared to men that are absent or injured on site. If gender data continues to remain invisible, then the suffering of women like Roja will also remain invisible. Companies need to measure the impact of their actions on women so that they can start to address the inequalities that exist. Secondly, we learned that it's time for the apparel sector to drive transformative change. The global pandemic has highlighted the importance and urgency of taking action for gender equality. The UN issued a warning highlighting the aggravated impacts of COVID for women already living on the economic margins. But not just any change is needed. Transformative change is vital to the achievement of gender equality and women's empowerment. Companies need to shift their approach from avoiding gender related impacts and disclosing what is necessary to meet legislative requirements to proactively addressing inequalities. For example, with respect to health and safety, a majority of companies considered workers health, safety and hygiene needs. For instance, by requiring their suppliers to provide access to toilets separated by gender, drinking water and appropriate personal protective equipment. However, only three companies require their suppliers to have an on-site health clinic with a credentialed health provider. While 13 companies publish gender pay gap information for their operations in the UK in accordance with global legis in, sorry, national legislation, only two companies publish their overall gender pay gap. Companies need to move from focusing on preventing harm to women to taking action that has positive impacts on them. Our research shows that less than 11% of the publicly available information displays leading practice by companies. And in order to create the change that is needed for the SDGs to be achieved, companies need to lead and not follow. Thirdly, we learned that strategic approach to gender is the way forward. The pathway to gender equality requires business to take an integrated and holistic approach across their entire value chain that considers the many interconnected dimensions affecting gender equality, such as health and well-being, representation and violence and harassment. Only then can companies truly drive transformative and sustainable change. Our report shows that while some companies have committed to promoting gender equality and women's empowerment, the efforts are not carried out in a strategic way. For example, while a majority of companies assess take action in at least three elements of the value chain, only two companies indicate that they have gender efforts that span corporate, workplace, supply chain, community, as well as marketplace. Further, just over half the companies disclose information for five of the dimensions affecting gender equality that we assess, but only three companies reveal details about their gender efforts across all seven dimensions assessed. However, to sound on a positive note, every company included in the agenda baseline report is taking action in some respect to drive gender equality and women's empowerment with leading practices identified across all dimensions. It is these efforts that need to be accelerated. To get the world to where it needs to be, we need to empower women who make up more than half of the global population. And the solution starts with making the invisible visible. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much. And what rich data to drive our conversation today. Um, we have time for just one question. So let me take the liberty of doing that, which is that you mentioned that every company that the World Benchmarking Alliance assessed is taking action to drive gender equality and women's empowerment. Can you just share with us what some of the leading practices are that you identified? Sure, Seema, that's such a great question. So some of the leading practices that we saw included um, at the corporate level, 
seven companies have gone beyond making a public commitment to gender equality and women's empowerment and have established specific time bound targets. So for example, Caring has a target to reach gender balance and end the gender pay gap by 2025. Uh, in the workplace, 13 companies have a mechanism in place to resolve grievances that have gender responsive elements. So for example, both GAP and PVH, who we'll hear from later, um, have user confidentiality as part of that mechanism, anonymous reporting, the verbal submission of grievances and protection against non-retaliation. And then in the supply chain, seven companies publish information where they signal a commitment towards gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, an example of that is Levi, who requires suppliers to have processes in place to listen to workers and identify local needs in areas such as hygiene and sanitation, sexual and reproductive health, and violence and harassment. Um, so those are just a few examples of the leading practices we've identified. And I think from our research, it's clear that we need to see more of these in order to close the gender gap. Thank you so much, Shem. And it'll be so interesting to hear the corporate and civil society responses to the report as well. So let me move us now um, to the corporate commitment. So I'm I, at two years ago at the United Nations Foundation, our team at the Universal Access Project launched a new initiative, the Private Sector Action for Women's Health and Empowerment. And the idea is to drive corporate action on gender equality and make public commitments. And we are really grateful to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Merck for Mothers and UK Aid for their support and funding of this work. And I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, David Wofford, our initiative senior director to talk more about the initiative and progress to date. So David, so everyone has context here. What is the initiative about? Well, Thanks, uh, Seema. It began with a very simple proposition. Uh, the companies need to embed women's health, starting with reproductive health, as the centerpiece of women's empowerment in global supply chains. This pandemic has shown that a supply chain where workers lack access to health services is not resilient. So we do believe that resilient supply chains of the future will need to adopt our initiative's three pillars for action, women's health, protection against violence, and professional advancement, with health as a starting point. Through this initiative, we reach out to global brands, regional manufacturers, agribusiness, and other business groups, asking them to make meaningful commitments to women's health and empowerment. Well, my natural next question then is, what do, what do we mean by meaningful commitments? Well, the commitment form on our website that everyone can see goes into more detail, but the first thing is a commitment should not be a one-off program that does some good things, but has no lasting impact. For instance, a business needs to say how it will sustain its activities, not just for a year or two, but for long-term. Second, we want to see a commitment to systemic change, really changing how women's health is addressed from the ground up. It's important for companies to make long-term changes to internal policies and operations that ensure women workers have access to services, training, and professional advancement. Increasingly, we want companies to tie their goals um, to sourcing decisions and to percentage goals um, for reaching their suppliers, as some commitment makers already do. Yeah, really changing the business model. And um, how do we know that a company is actually fulfilling its commitment after the announcement? You know, Seema, this is a really important point. You know, the UN Foundation is not a compliance agency. We don't monitor workplaces. We do ask companies to give us annual progress reports on what they've done. We now ask commitment makers to describe their process for tracking their progress. But the key point is that businesses make a very public and measurable commitment that puts them on the record. We hope this information will contribute to organizations like WBA promoting corporate accountability and transparency. No one suggests that providing health services and trainings through the workplace is a silver bullet for all the challenges women workers face. But we believe these commitments can build a foundation for deeper change. I should emphasize that this initiative is not telling companies specifically what to do. There's no UN Foundation Women's Health Program. Our role as convener is to convince and cajole companies to take meaningful action on women's health using the resources, partners, and know-how that already exist. And there's a lot. Today, unlike 20 years ago, no one needs to start from scratch. You can work with BSR's HER Project or GAP's PACE Program or take advantage of the Empowered Work Resources 
UNFPA and affiliates of International Plant Parented and Marie Stopes can provide services and training. Many global and regional and community organizations have deep experience like CARE or our partner Swasti in India, which is developing innovative approaches for health and wellness, including clustered services, mobile health and e-learning. And we had 11 companies stand up last year in 2019 at the Women Deliver Conference. Can you share more about the status of those commitments, especially given the pandemic, and then also share with us our new commitments today? Well, one surprise for all of us is that even though COVID hit many industries really hard, these 11 companies are staying the course. We just released our progress report today. The pandemic disrupted everything and understandably many have had to change their timetables and tactics and revisit how they will reach their goals. But all of them are standing by their commitment goals. These 11 are Columbia Sportswear, Ethical Apparel, Africa, Hella Clothing, Inditex, Lindex, Moss Holdings, Nordstrom, Shahi, Sharehope, Twinings, and Unilever. As for new commitments, uh, when COVID first hit, it seemed unlikely would be any new ones this year. The fact is the pandemic rather has made elevated the business case for health. Worker health is a business priority, not a perk anymore. We are pleased that five businesses and business organizations have made new commitments to reach more than 500,000 workers. I also need to acknowledge the good work of our consultants, Samita Social Ventures in India and Keen Solutions in Kenya that helped secure several of these commitments. So let me now turn to our five commitment makers so we can hear from them. And I'd like to start with the Nuja Jayawardena, Head of Women's Empowerment Advocacy and Code of Conduct at Mass Holding, South, Africa, South Asia's largest apparel manufacturer. It made a commitment last year, but has already achieved its goals. Hi, Thanuja. I'd like you Hi, to David. tell us about, how are you? Um, I'd love to tell you, tell us about your expanded commitment and why you made it. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity, David. Um, as you said, MAS is the largest apparel solutions provider in South Asia with a 98,000 strong workforce globally, 75% um, of which is female. And for us, we're very happy to be expanding our commitment to reach 20,000 new beneficiaries by next year um, to provide education awareness and services in reproductive health and rights. Uh, women's health, and also gender-based violence issues. I want to say that this is work that we started um, very, very early on um, through our Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality Program, which is a focused effort um, to address inequalities when it comes to women in the workplace. Um, we launched the program in 2003, and we've been addressing gender equality through many different dimensions. Um, with the commitment last year, we started a new program in collaboration with the Family Planning Association of Sri Lanka and also experts in law and advocacy for gender-based violence uh, to train trainers in-house so that we have the capacity and empower our own employees to be advocates in these areas, not only within the organization, but also within their communities. Um, while we address uh, gender equality through many different angles, we firmly believe that health and well-being and also freedom from gender-based violence is crucial uh, and a basic need. For us, all of this work did not start uh, as a result of ex any external requirement or a need to align even with um, global benchmarks or customer requirements. Uh, they do align very well with all of this right now, but it has very much sprung from an internal leadership drive. Well, thank you, Thanuja. That's, that's really wonderful to hear. And um, we know you have a deep commitment to sustaining it. Next, I'd like to introduce Urshad Mecca, president and CEO of Rita, India's largest shoe manufacturer. Greetings, Urshad. And please tell us about your commitment and why you made it. Hi, hi, David. Thank you so much. I'd like to basically, uh, you know, give you an idea that we started in the late, uh, in the mid '70s, actually, uh, with women empowerment. And today we have a, a, a five, actually, a five percent cap on male workers in our company. So ninety-five percent of our twenty-nine thousand workers. Are women and 
when we the way we've achieved this and and we got ranked as the the one of the best places for women to work in india and 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 the way we achieved this was uh you know uh addressing we came up we've come up with this happy factory index that we use that we rate every unit of ours and and we we judge how how the management how happy the workers are in the in the facility um i'll just share with you one thing you know um uh, one of the things that made a big difference with the empowerment uh, idea was when i uh, my phone number for instance i've shared it with 29000 all the 29000 workers right and you would think that i my phone would be ringing non stop but the uh, the the value of that the power that that gives every individual uh to know that they can call the ceo and complain about anything or just talk directly and and, and likewise i also have visited about 1000 workers in their houses in, and and just met with them for coffee just to interact with them and the benefits that we have seen doing all this is we have a, a, a relative to our competitors a much higher productivity level we have the lowest absenteeism so there is in terms of of sustaining it there's a lot of business sense today you know yeah you do it for the for what is right but there is also a business sense in doing this well we really appreciate your commitment and i realize you've agreed to reach 25000 uh women workers um through 20 um and and with with uh training and awareness on reproductive health and maternal health um and and other things so we really appreciate it Um I'm going to turn now because of time to um East Africa and I'm really pleased to introduce Victoria Mutungwa, quality insurance manager from Fresh Del Monte Kenya, a regional leader in exports in fresh pineapple juice and canned uh pineapples. Hi Vicky, uh can you tell us Hi. about Del Monte's commitment and why you did it? Okay. Uh Del Monte has committed to empower 10,000 women including our own employees. and the neighboring community by providing them with sexual and reproductive health information and services as well as addressing other critical needs in our six health clinics by 2024 we'll invest in trainings on sexual harassment and gender based violence in and out of the workplace for both the women and the men this in addition to engaging our male employees as gender advocates It is our employees' well-being that actually gives Del Monte Kenya the capacity to provide wholesome, safe and fresh products and we do our part by ensuring that our staff is cared for through provision of fair wages, a safe workplace, access to quality healthcare and opportunities for growth regardless of the gender, background, race or religion. We strongly believe that businesses are a formidable force for positive change and that by integrating women's empowerment into corporate strategy we can complement and enhance the work done by governments and ngos we will leverage on available resources that is our six clinics and the annual budget to fund these programs thank you david thank you so much vicky unfortunately um the ethiopia horticultural producers association could not be with, with us today they are building on their work with her project years ago and they're planning to reach 40,000 workers um 30,000 of which are women um with menstrual health family planning maternal health and protection from gender based based violence by 2025 so we're sorry they couldn't join us but finally i'd like to turn uh to our last commitment by PBH Corporation a global brand and fashion company i'm pleased to introduce Marissa Pagnani Magowan senior vice president for corporate responsibility hi marissa can you tell us about your commitment and why you made it Yes, hi David. Thank you so much for having us today and to the UN Foundation and World Benchmarking Alliance for all they're doing to bring attention um and support to these critical topics. So, why did PBH make this commitment? Um PBH has a global supply chain with approximately 1 million workers, predominantly female, and we have a corporate purpose of driving fashion forward for good. So making this commitment with the UN Foundation is an opportunity for PVH to further accelerate our efforts to empower women across our supply chain and work towards our own forward fashion priority of providing professional and life skill development programs and services to 500,000 women across our supply chain by 2030. Importantly, we recently expanded our existing commitment 
which we made in 2019 to include the provision of services for women alongside programming. And I know, David, we've spoken about this. It, this is in recognition that pairing training and development programs with access to services will increase impact by addressing a broader range of needs, strengthening the development of enabling environments for women, and helping them to apply the learnings from training and programs by accessing an ecosystem of essential services. So really looking forward to um, continuing the work together and partnering with organizations like many on this phone. Thank you, Marissa. Take a very brief question. You're one of 36 brands being ranked uh, by the uh, WBA. What's your reaction to their report and the challenges for you? If you could briefly let us into your insights. So we are a, a big fan of transparency and we spend a lot of time and effort on reporting. We are grateful to the World Benchmarking Alliance for bringing a common language and a set of standards to this topic of work. Um, I think it, it helps us level the playing field, raise the bar, inspire others, learn from others. It pushes us um, and we are, we are very supportive of the benchmarking work. We have much work to do ahead of us, uh, thanks to the reporting as well. But I do think it's critical that we get consistent information with common language out there so that we as, as companies can move um, in, in one direction. I will say I also very much appreciate the use of industry standards and common programming to measure um, and benchmark us. Thank you so much. So now we want to uh, take a deeper dive on the WBA gender baseline report. And we're really pleased to have Abby Davison, head of Gap Foundation with us today to talk about the report. Hello, Abby. Hi. Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Look, Gap has been recognized as a strong uh, performer on the WBA baseline report with a number of leading practices. Obviously, PACE program is a big one and you're aiming to reach 1 million women globally by the end of 2022 and give women the foundational skills, technical training and support they need to advance in the workplace in their personal lives. So PACE is one example, but we'd love to hear how else you are driving gender equality and women's empowerment through your value chain. Well, first I wanna thank you for inviting me here to share more about what we're doing at Gap Bank. And it's a pleasure to be here among other esteemed companies who are all working towards gender equality. I will highlight three ways that we invest in women across our value chain. Um, the first is in our Gap Inc. workplace. Our founders, Doris and Don Fisher, were equal partners with equal investments in our business. And so you could say that gender equality was really woven into our DNA from day one. Currently, we have a female CEO and CFO and general counsel. That's who I report to. Um, so, and, and strong female representation across all levels. In fact, we skew very heavily female um, in our store manager population at, at more than 70% women. Gap Inc. has employee resource groups for historically underrepresented populations, including a group for women and for parents and caregivers. And these groups provide safe spaces for employees to seek support, advice, and connection with um, from those who share their identities. So for example, uh, our women's resource group Gap Will started a series of safe space conversations focused on topics related to racial justice and the unique experience of black, indigenous and people of color and colleagues. We've also leveraged Gap Parents, uh, which I founded and, and actually now co-lead to initiate conversations with the Gap Inc. leadership team about flexible work and support for working parents, which has obviously come to a very um, uh, intense point during COVID. Uh, so in addition, Gap Inc. has a policy of zero tolerance against harassment and violence. For Gap Inc. employees, we offer a hotline that is managed by an independent third-party vendor where employees can submit claims uh, free and anonymously 24-7. And similarly, we require our suppliers to establish grievance mechanisms to enable women workers to voice their concerns anonymously. The second uh, place I'll highlight is in our supply chain. Sexual harassment and gender-based violence are taken very seriously at Gap Inc. Our supplier sustainability team has focused efforts around prevention of sexual harassment, including development of guidelines for suppliers to follow, and a series of trainings designed both for supplier leadership and factory workers. 
The first round of trainings to leadership was delivered earlier this year, and the more intensive worker management trainings are planned for the majority of our strategic suppliers this fall. The third is in our PLACE program, which you mentioned. This began as a program in factory settings and now comes to life in communities as well. PACE is one of GAP Inc.'s most significant investments and commitments, and one that we are particularly proud of. At GAP Inc., we believe that investing in women and girls education delivers high returns, not only for those women and girls, but also to create changes in systems that badly need to change. The transformation we see in women who go through PACE is, in some cases, quite profound. I'd like to share a quote from Nguyen, a garment worker in Vietnam who went through the program. She said, when I heard about PACE, my first thought was that I was too old. I grew up farming and it made me very self-reliant. I said, I would try the PACE lessons and if I didn't like it, I would quit. After those two classes, people I'd never spoken to before told me I seemed friendlier and more open. A couple of days ago, I applied for a leadership role here at the factory Everyone came up to me and said they supported me. I just found out I got the position. So no other policy intervention is likely to have a more positive multiplier effect on progress across the development goals than the education of women and girls. There's evidence of a strong correlation between educating women and girls and increases in women's earnings, improvements in child and family health and nutrition, increases in school enrollment, so many more. I know I don't need to tell um, folks on this panel um, that there's, there's just such tremendous benefits. And we believe that women also play a critical role in coming up with an effective response to crisis, as well as promoting sustainable economic growth and development. And so empowering and including women in the economic and social decision-making processes of countries, especially in response to COVID-19, is critical to ensure effective and sustainable solutions. Thanks so much, Abby. We're, we're short on time and we really appreciate your coming. I, and also to note that GAP, you know, the PACE program is licensable and that uh, PVH and others are able to license it and PVH is using it themselves uh, as part of their commitment. So it's a, it's a great project that can be used collectively. Um, I wanna turn now back to Seema and thank all our commitment makers and everyone that spoke so far for, for your commitment and your time. Thank you, David and Abby and all of our commitment makers. There are quite a few questions coming in through the chat, so we'll look forward to that at the uh, Q&A session. And this is a great segue, um, as I'd now like to turn to hear from women workers in their own words, how workplace health programs have impacted their lives. So in this video, which we'll see now, we'll hear from Anu and Vanita from Lodge Exports in Bangalore, India, and with thanks to our partners at Swasti. Hello and welcome to Swasti. We are here today at Large Exports Private Limited, a garment factory located in Bangalore, Karnataka, India. We'll be talking to Anu and Vanita, two women who participated in Swasti's Invest for Wellness program. My name is Anu and I am a large expert in Sample Taylor. I am a in Bangalore. I am in Bangalore. I am in Bangalore. I am in large export in Haroshti, in Kajabadon Hoppatoy, finishing the department. So, what do you think about health problems in the Nodidira? I am in the Nodidira, 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 in the Amen or he held with their fabric use marbury, chemical mix agate, but the infection birthday, then the Garbakosha cancer agate, but the Prati on the Baradi birthday, other Koskan even made pad use maddy, insulin copy, the other news maddy, Yatara prolongo heno ilarium, normal calcium marta, no tundre nila, Tumbajanke, Hoteno Borodu, Susta Godu, Ameletindine Mardang and Geborodu, Dead Tamalella, Period Jastia Godu, Interla problems agodu, Adela Namatra share marder with Rala Nami Susta Gute problem of Utrenta. In a Makala, Idrubag and Tabandra, Istogen Gutirla, Maklubagitra, and Markum Beko, in a Vita family planning to home Beko, and Taurino Gutirilla. Other Ivagala or informati on the Maguinda in Mogunga, Moroshantra, Bekuram Gap, Pekon, and Copertyak school in on condoms, use Markum Bodo, the doctor 
ಸಲಹೆ ತಗೊಂಡು ಟ್ಯಾಬ್ಲೆಟ್ಸ್ ತಗೊಳ್ಳಿ ಅಂತೆಲ್ಲ ಇನ್ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಮಾಡೋದ್ರಿಂದ ತುಂಬಾ ಜನ ಅದನ್ನ ತಗೊಂಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅದರಿಂದ ನಮ್ಗೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಆಗಿದೆ ರಕ್ತಹೀನತ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಇತ್ತು ಆ ನನ್ಗೆ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಏಟ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇತ್ತು ಆಮೇಲೆ ನಾನು ಈ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಐ ಫಾರ್ ಇ ವಿ ವಿ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಇಂದ ಎಲ್ಲ ತಿಳ್ಕೊಂಡು ನಾನು ಇಂಪ್ರೂವ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದೀನಿ ರಕ್ತ ಏನಂತೆ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಇವಾಗ ಇಲ್ಲ ಈ ಐ ಫೋರ್ ಬಿ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಬಂದ ಮೇಲೆ ನಂಗೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಆಗಿದೆ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ನನಗೆ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ನಾನು ಯಾವತ್ತು ಬ್ಲಡ್ ಚೆಕ್ಅಪ್ ಮಾಡಿಸ್ತೋಳಲ್ಲ ಅದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ನಂಗೆ ಥೈರಾಯ್ಡ್ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಇತ್ತು ಯಾವಾಗ ಮಾಡಿ ಹೇಳಿದಾಗ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಥೈರಾಯ್ಡ್ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಇದೆ ಟ್ರೀಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ತಗೊಳ್ಳಿ ಟ್ರೀಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ತಗೊಳ್ಳಿ ಅಂತ ನಾನು ಪ್ರತಿದಿನ ಟ್ಯಾಬ್ಲೆಟ್ಸ್ ತಗೊಂತಿದ್ದೆ ಆದ್ರೂ ನಂಗೆ ಅದು ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಆಗ್ತಿರ್ಲಿಲ್ಲ ಐ ಫೋರ್ ಬಿ ಟ್ರೈನಿಂಗ್ ಬಂದ ಮೇಲೆ ಅದರಿಂದ ನಂಗೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಆಗಿದೆ ಏನು ಅಂದ್ರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಬಾಡಿನ ನಾವು ಹೆಂಗೆ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಬಹುದು ಒಂದ್ ಎಕ್ಸಸೈಸ್ ಆಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಒಂದು ಫುಡ್ ತಗೊಳ್ಳೋ ರೀತಿ ಆಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಯಾವ ರೀತಿ ತಗೊಂಡ್ರೆ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಏನ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಅನ್ನೋದನ್ನ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಟ್ರೈನಿಂಗ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ತುಂಬಾನೇ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೈನ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇದರಿಂದ ನಂಗೆ ಥೈರಾಯ್ಡ್ ಬಂದು ಮುಕ್ಕಾಲ್ ಭಾಗ ಕಮ್ಮಿ ಆಗಿದೆ ಈಗ ಟೂ ಮಂತ್ಸ್ ಒಂದ್ಸಲಿ ಅವರು ಬ್ಲಡ್ ಚೆಕ್ಅಪ್ ಮಾಡಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದಾರೆ ನಾನು ಮಾಡ ನಾನು ಮಾಡಿಸ್ಕೊತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಇವಾಗ ನನಗೆ ಬಂದು ಲೆವೆನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಇದೆ ನಾನು ನನ್ನ ಮಗಳಿಗೂ ಮಾಡಿಸ್ತೆ ಅವಳಿಗೆ ಅವಳಿಗೂ ತುಂಬಾ ಕಮ್ಮಿ ಇತ್ತು ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಅವಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಕೇರ್ ತಗೊಳ್ಳೋದು ಕಮ್ಮಿ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೆ ಮೇಲೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಬರೋ ಇದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ಅವಳನ್ನ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಆ ಇದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ಬಿಟ್ಬಿಟ್ಟಿದೆ ಈಗ ಈ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಬಂದ ಮೇಲೆ ನಂಗೆ ತುಂಬಾನೇ ಖುಷಿ ಆಗಿದೆ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ನನ್ನ ಮಗಳು ತುಂಬಾ ಹೆಲ್ದಿ ಆಗಿದೆ ಬಟ್ಟೆ ಹಾಕೊಳ್ತಾರೆ ಅವರು ಕಸ್ಟಮರ್ಸ್ ಕನ್ಸ್ಯೂಮರ್ಸ್ ಅವರು ನಿಮ್ ತರ ಮಹಿಳೆಯರು ಬರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಏನ್ ತಿಳ್ಕೋಬೇಕು ಆ ಗಾರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಒಂದ್ ಗಾರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ರೆಡಿ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕಂದ್ರೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಜನ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿರ್ತಾರೆ ಸೊ ಅವರೆಲ್ಲ ತಿಳ್ಕೋಬೇಕು ಯಾವ ತರ ಕಷ್ಟಪಟ್ಟಿ ಎಲ್ಲ ಜನ ಬಂದು ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿರ್ತಾರೆ ಒಂದು ಗಾರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ರೆಡಿ ಆಗ್ಬೇಕಂದ್ರೆ ಎಷ್ಟು ಖರ್ಚ್ ಕಷ್ಟಪಟ್ಟಿ ರೆಡಿ ಮಾಡಿರ್ತಾರೆ ಅಂತ ಅವ್ಳು ತಿಳ್ಕೊಂಡ್ರೆ ನಂಗೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಖುಷಿ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ನಾನು ಈ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ಬಂದ ಹದಿನೈದು ವರ್ಷ ಆಗಿದೆ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಈ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ಎಲ್ಲ ಇದ್ದು ನನ್ನ ಸೂಪರ್ವೈಸರ್ ಪೋಸ್ಟ್ ಹೋಗ್ಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ತುಂಬಾನೇ ಆಸೆ ಇದೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಇನ್ನ ಮನೆ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಅಂತ ಬಂದಾಗ ನನ್ನ ಮಗಳಿಗೆ ಒಂದು ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಕೊಡ್ಬೇಕು ಅವ್ಳಿಗೆ ಒಂದೊಳ್ಳೆ ಫ್ಯೂಚರ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಅವ್ಳು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಆಗ್ಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ತುಂಬಾ ಆಸೆ ಪಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾಳೆ ಇದೇ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇದ್ದು ಇನ್ನ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಮಾಡಿ ಅವ್ಳಿಗೆ ಒಂದೊಳ್ಳೆ ಲೈಫ್ ಕೊಡ್ಬೇಕು ಮ್ಯಾಮ್ ಅಷ್ಟೇ ನಮಗೆ ಒಂದು ಗುರಿ ಇತ್ತು ಮೇಡಮ್ ಆ ನಮ್ಮ ಫಾದರ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೈರ್ಡ್ ಆಗ್ಬಿಟ್ರು ನನ್ಗೊಂದ್ ಗುರಿ ಇತ್ತು ನಾನ್ ಫ್ಯಾಷನ್ ಡಿಸೈನರ್ ಆಗ ಆಗ್ಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಸೊ ನನಗೆ ಅದು ಆಗೋಕ್ಕಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಅಮೌಂಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಇಂದ ಮಾಡೋಕ್ಕಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಗಾರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಗೆ ಬಂದು ಗಾರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಬಂದು ಸೇರ್ಕೊಂಡೆ ಅದರಿಂದ ನಾನು ಮುಂದೆ ಮಾಡಬಹುದು ಅನ್ನೋದು ಯೋಚನೆ ಇದೆ ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ ಅದೊಂದು ಗುರಿ ನಂದು ಐತೆ ಪೂರ ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ We are so grateful to Anu and Vanita for taking the time to share their perspectives. And if, in case anyone wants to watch that video again, or if you had any tech troubles, we will send out a link to the video so you can watch it. Uh, so now um, we'll be hearing from civil society leaders on how they are seeing worker health and well-being programs play out in various contexts and how they view the issues raised by the WBA's gender baseline report. So I'd like to welcome Lavanya Garg, a senior manager and chief of staff for Good Business Lab. And Good Business Lab is a research NGO based in India, focused on improving workers' lives by identifying worker needs, designing solutions, and testing for well-being impact and financial returns. And Good Business Lab is associated with Shahi, a major apparel manufacturer and a 2019 UN founder commitment maker. So welcome to Lavanya. And uh, I'd like to welcome Perpetua Waitera. Uh, Perpetua is the training and business development manager for NOPE International Institute. NOPE is an NGO with operations in the East African region and whose mission is to build the capacities of communities and organizations, including
key takeaway that comes from another phone survey round that we conducted in April 2020. Among 560 female migrant garment workers, average age about 24, over 90% unmarried. Compared to November 2019, when 70% of them sent remittances back home, only 8% sent remittances in April 2020. This is despite the fact that they were paid full salary. Increase in expenditure was the main reason cited by workers for not remitting. We conducted a follow-up survey with the same group of workers in June 2020, and a third started remitting money at this stage, so still more than April 2020, but very less compared to pre-COVID. This time, the reason cited for reduced remittances included saving money, which brings me to the third key takeaway that stress about finance was while lower during the lockdown in India, but perceived financial constraint both on workers and their families remain. Broadly, these results suggest that cost and economic uncertainty loom large over this population despite factories reopening. It just showcases the importance of knowing this information and having this data as companies um, turn to action. Let me turn to Perpetua. Perpetua, how does Lavanya's description compare with the situation in Nairobi in Kenya, where you are based, and other countries that you work in? Uh, thank you very much, Sima. I would say that initially women were very scared for their health. They were also scared for their families. Um, and then some of them also lost jobs, especially the ones who were on contract. Some of them were sent on unpaid leave, but also some continued working. And the ones who continued working are very happy because the companies were able to set up a COVID-19 prevention a strategies like social distancing and wearing of masks. The other major change for women workers is that now women are at home. So the women who, workers who have small children have increased responsibilities, especially if their children are below 10 years old. However, the ones with older children have a bit of help. Like if a woman has a 16 year old, the 16 year old is able to help take care of their smaller children while the woman is at home. So, and of course there have also been uh, economic adjustments at home. Because uh, if a woman was earning um, money for ex maybe her spouse also lost a job, so there has been major economic adjustments for the average, the average woman worker. Thank you, Perpetua. And let's yeah. just stay with you for a minute. Um, I mean, can you say more about when companies? Um, invest in the health and well-being of their workers and, and work on issues related to gender equality. I mean, what kind of impact do you see um, that these activities have on the lives of workers, particularly women and their families? So, uh, so uh, co when companies invest on uh, gender equality programs and health and well-being for women, it means that the women are able to enjoy greater health they're able to enjoy a, a greater sexual reproductive health, they're healthier. They also get um, a, a good attitude towards health seeking behavior. They are able to go to hospital or to the clinic when they need to. And this um, attitude towards accessing good health also extends to the family. So you'll find that the woman will also encourage her partner and her children to also go to hospital if they need be. And they're also able, uh, these programs are actually save lives. You've had cases where a woman is able to catch a cancer before it gets to stage three or stage four, and therefore, you know, her life is saved. We also have women who are able to space their children. They are able to do family planning, so they are able to better balance their work life as well as their family life. I mean, everything that we all need to, to thrive in the workplace. So thank you so much. Let me turn back to Lavanya, and I actually want to switch this question a little bit. What is the impact for companies' viability and success if they invest in gender equity and women's health and empowerment for their employees? Lavinia? Yeah, um, so GDL's mission is to show that using rigorous research, investing in workers' well-being can be good for workers and at the same time profitable for business. And our focus areas cover a worker's journey of employment, so starting from enabling women to participate in paid work, to closing the skill gap, improving their work environment, whether it's tangible factors on the factory floor, such as lighting, 
or intangible factors such as sexual harassment and ultimately building holistic health outcomes. And under the fourth focus area, we include any kind of stressor to a worker's physical or mental health. And we have several projects running that are establishing exactly what you asked, the business viability of these programs. So some examples of that include tackling anemia, nudging workers for better eye health, menstrual hygiene management, and even tackling loneliness and mental health among young migrant workers. And we have time for just one last question. And uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Lavinia, but I welcome Perpetua's reactions too, which is about the baseline report. You know, if companies collect and disclose the kind of information being asked for by the World Benchmarking Alliance, in, in a, and this includes just as a reminder, providing a safe and healthy work environment, providing health information and services, paying workers a living wage, and providing workers with formal contracts, what kind of impact does that have? Lavinia? Yeah, uh, so we collect an insane amount of data for all our projects. And just to break it down broadly, we have administrative data set and we have data that we collect through surveys. This administrative data comes from the factory partner. So usually it's your productivity data, efficiency of our workers attriting, what's their attendance levels. And then in the thousands, we collect survey data. And depending on the project, this survey data includes gender behaviors, knowledge, household dynamics, mental health. And we have to undertake that exercise every time for every project. It is cost consuming. So any availability of data is a big plus for researchers because it, it enables us to look into more patterns, uh, especially as this grows. And if we have panel data going in the future on the same outcomes and looking at how they change over the years, uh, again, from the perspective of creating knowledge and even assisting organizations like GBL in our efforts, this is great. Uh, thank you so much, Lavinia. And Perpetua, any thoughts on this and on if companies collected this data, the impact it would have? I think that uh, if companies collected data and they shared it, it would help uh, in decision making. Data is very important for decision making. And when we get data that maybe demonstrates that there's an inequality, then if there's good governance, then the organization and other leadership and other organizations would be able to provide a solution for, for whatever the data is saying. So data is very important for objective decision making. Thank you, so the importance of transparency. Well, thank you both, Perpetua and Lavinia. I mean, it's truly both your work that helps keep worker voices and their perspectives at this table. And there are more questions coming your way during the question and answer session, which we will turn to now. And um, I'd like to turn to our colleague, Paulina Murphy, the Engagement Director at the World Benchmarking Alliance to facilitate that discussion. So Paulina, over to you. Thank you so much, Seema and everybody else. Um, so many thoughts coming in, so many already insights from, the, from our panelists. If you wish, um, as we go into this Q&A, please do switch your uh, views back to gallery if you've had it on speaker so that you can see everybody who's in this conversation and we might have a, a more of an inclusive feel to, to the conversation. We have roughly 10 minutes, so we're gonna go quite fast, um, but keep them coming in. I'll, I'll try and cover as many as possible. And please also continue to amplify this conversation using hashtag uh, Unga75. Um, I would also like, as well as sharing your questions um, for panelists, I would also uh, love for you all to think about your own commitments. We've heard from companies, the commitment makers, um, and, and the steps that they are taking on gender equality and women's health and on social, uh, uh, women's health and um, gender equality. But um, there are things, change starts with all of us. Um, and we focused on a lot, of, a lot uh, during this discussion on leadership and accountability and transparency. So can I ask you all to be transparent? Can I ask you all to start making commitments and however big, however small, and share with us here so that we can carry this agenda forward. Uh, and this is just the beginning of the conversation. For our part, uh, the WBA will uh, follow this progress report that we've launched today with the full benchmark next year. Um, and we'll continue to shine the light on progress and hold the laggards to account through the drive for transparency um, and focusing in on the supply chain. 
So um, that's enough uh, from that. Um, there was a question right at the beginning to uh, Shamista um, on uh, thinking more about the transparency. How do you move, move companies towards transparency? Do you use a carrot or do you use a stick? Uh, thanks, Paulina, for um, raising that question. I think um, what we can all agree on is that women and girls have human rights and human rights are universal and must be protected. So with that in mind, um, on carrots and sticks, I think the answer is both. Our benchmarks look to drive transparency from companies and incentivize them to take action to contribute to the SDGs and show leadership in doing so. And by turning sustainability into a competitive race to the top, the hope is that WBA will empower society. So for example, empower businesses to stimulate long-term performance, um, empower consumers to make more informed decisions on where they spend money, uh, empower investors to rely on better data in making um, investment decisions. And so through our benchmarks, we act as a global mechanism to hold companies to account and make sure that they turn their commitments into action and drive impact towards the SDGs. And so it's through both leadership and accountability that we can bring around systems change. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and, and so leadership and, and accountability both are incredibly important. And uh, with our commitment makers, we also heard a lot about internal company leadership, which starts at the, at the board level, at the executive level. Um, and there was a question in the, in the group chat about uh, relating to this. So what is the role of also governments in ensuring women's health and empowerment at the workplace? So enhancing the leadership position being taken by governments themselves, what can, uh, by companies themselves, what can governments do to support that effort? Um, I'd like to open that for any commitment maker who, who would like to comment. So I knew that would happen. And maybe I can go to Victoria from Del Monte because um, uh, you, you actually mentioned about the role of governments in your introductory remarks. Um, I believe the government uh, provides support. Um, I believe the government um, can provide support in, in the systems that, um, that they put in place for companies to follow. Um, for example, uh, Del Monte does follow the, um, we subscribe to the ethical trading initiative, which ensures um, fairness in employment. And we have um, audits that are carried out in order to make sure that um, this is uh, being complied with. Um, yeah, so basically that's it I would have to say about that. Thank you, Victoria. And sorry for throwing the spotlight um, uh, uh, directly at you. I'd like to stay on the commitment maker um, agenda, however, um, because there's been quite a few comments uh, relating to those. Um, how can commitment makers share their best practices with each other so that we can build on success rather and learn from each other's efforts rather than duplicate what's what's um, what's what's already been going on? Um, now, um, I understand from um, uh, from Marissa um, that uh, PVH adopted uh, the GAP PACE program actually uh, but Marissa has had to leave and I was hoping to call on um, her colleague from, from PVH uh, to maybe share a little bit more about this agenda and do we have um, the PVH colleague uh, Smit Gowen uh, on the line? Hi, yes, I, I am on the line. Thank you. Uh, would you be able to answer that question um, on Marissa's behalf? Yes, and I'm sorry, do you mind repeating it cut out for a second? Sorry. So the question is, how can commitment makers share their best practices with each other and build on uh, successes rather than reinventing something from the beginning? And Marissa mentioned that um, PVH had um, uh, adopted uh, the GAP PACE program. Is that is that correct? Yes, so we adopted the GAP PACE program um, because it's an evidence-based learning program that had numerous economic studies that demonstrated the business and social impacts. Um, and at PVH as a corporation, typically um, we don't like to recreate the wheel or duplicate efforts. Um, and so 
uh, instead of developing our own proprietary models, um, we like to take something that's been tried and, and tested within the industry um, and then of course implement that as well. Um, and in terms of you know, achieving best practices, um, we are currently gathering a lot of the best practices that we've received from the vendors in terms of implementing the PACE program and also um, have been part of industry conversations that are looking at harmonizing um, women's empowerment curriculums and then deploying that uh, throughout uh, the industry as well. Thank you so much, Muti, uh, for stepping in um, uh, and giving us further insights from PVH. Um, if, uh, if, if there's another commitment maker who would like to answer that question, please feel free. Hi, this is Tanuja. Hey, Paulina. Um, just to say that um, we, we also work with the GAP PACE program and we work with PVH that has um, ad adopted the same program and the MAS Women Go Beyond program as well. We share knowledge whenever possible and for us participating in um, in, on platforms such as this um, and other partnerships we have, for example, with the IFC, with the UN Global Compact, uh, all give us an opportunity to share um, best practices and learning um, and that bringing, bringing organizations together like this um, is a great opportunity to share learnings uh, and best practices. We've learned a lot from, from the partnerships that we've had. Thank you so much for, for adding that, that view. I love this. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to come to Abby because your program is clearly making an impact from a leadership perspective within the industry. Well, it's been I mean, such a tremendous partnership across um, so many organizations, the NGOs that we partner with um, to the other companies. And um, actually we are a founding partner of the Empower at Work Collaborative. So that's a partnership with CARE, ILO Better Work, BSR, and ICRW to transform how the industry approaches women's empowerment and gender equity programming. So across these five organizations and their investment in women's empowerment over the past decade plus, we have reached a collective 5 million women in apparel supply chains. And um, we think that the current uh, figure is about 60 to 75 million women globally. And we, we acknowledge that the current challenges that limit our ability for programming to sustainably scale is their primarily duplication of effort and lack of transparency. And so um, Empower at Work is in the process of developing an operating model that will deliver a standardized implementation model um, and provide greater visibility into the trainings happening in factory settings. So we are very excited to streamline these efforts and present this model to the industry in the coming months. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to bring in the, the so Lavanya uh, talked about the impact of uh, COVID on women in her initial remarks. Um, and I, I'd love to bring that view. There, there was a question in the chat box about the pandemic and the impact um, uh, to the female workforce. And so I'd like to turn that to the companies who are represented here. Um, and, and how has the question is, how has the pandemic impacted the female workforce availability and any job losses in 2020. Um, Abby, maybe as, as, can I come back to you to start us off with me on that one? I'm sorry, would you mind saying that one more time? My, my kids go to school in my dining room now, so they were making some noise in the background. That's a, actually, well, the question was about COVID impact, so there you giving us a personal uh, <laughs> story that we can all relate to, but the, um, the question was actually how has the pandemic impacted the female workforce availability uh, this year um, and any job losses also uh, in 2020? Well, I think um, in fact that was a, a very perfect uh, segue then. I mean, I think that the, um, as we know, the burden of unpaid care falls primarily on women. And so as the um, systems that uh, families look to to provide care, whether that is grandparents, who we know are um, as elderly people are at higher risk right now, um, our school systems, our um, private care providers um, have been stripped away. 
so many women find themselves in positions of having to choose between caring for their families and being productive at work. And so that tension continues to play out. And until there are some creative solutions, I fear that um, no matter if companies solve this problem individually for their employees and their workers, there it won't approach the solutions that are needed. So I think there's clear evidence that collective um, action is required here. Thank you, Abby. Irshad, could I come to you with that same question, a, a view from, from your perspective? And then there was a separate question to you in the chat box, which was um, also the, what is the percentage of women in senior management? You talked about the percentage of women you have overall, um, but that this was focused on your senior management. So in effect, that's two questions to you, the senior management percentage, and then the impact uh, of COVID on your uh, workforce and job losses. Um, initially, when uh, when the first shock came about, you know, uh, and the reactions from the, the different brands was uh, initial cancellations, hold your orders. We had to, you know, uh, rethink about our, our, the workforce, how many people, uh, you know, we, we would need to have. And while we discussed this, we, we opened up the dialogue with the workforce and we said, look, it looks like maybe 20% might have to lose jobs. So how can we share this burden as opposed to making it worse for a few? And, and interestingly, all the workforce agreed to share the burden by saying, we'll take a couple of days off and then make sure that no one has to lose a job. And that's what we followed. Now, since then, after the post the shock, the orders have started to flow back in and things have started to normalize. So, so the answer was, uh, we worked it out and, and we've not been affected and the larger community hasn't been affected as much uh, due to the, the reduction in orders. Uh, fortunately, because everyone worked together to share the burden. The answer to the second uh, uh, question in terms of, we don't have enough people in our senior management. We don't have enough uh, you know, representation in the senior management. And to a large degree, that is because we've not been able to, most of our factories are in the rural areas. We've not been able to find its sufficient qualifications in, uh, uh, you know, among the women workforce. To, to promote to senior management. So we started off a, a, a educational programming to, to, uh, to improve the educational qualifications. Today, we have over 500 graduates and 140 postgraduates who are working in the company. And they're all now have the choice to join into management trainee programs and build for the future. So, so although they are well represented in the lower management and some in the mid, uh, we are hoping that we will over the next few years see a, a steady increase in uh, representation, in the higher management. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for ending on a positive as well. Um, but this is not really the end of the conversation. In fact, this is the beginning of the conversation. Um, and uh, we've talked about collaboration in this, the collaboration theme has come uh, very much through in this Q&A section. And I think we can say that we are thinking very much about the SG's agenda of inclusive multilateralism and how we all come together um, to achieve the 2030 agenda. Um, with that, I'm going to um, close the Q&A uh, session um, and hand back to Seema uh, for a few closing remarks. Thank you so much, Paulina, and obviously so much more to talk about. So we hope that this event is the beginning, as you said, and not the, the end. And um, I, just to say, I think we realized we had a lot of speakers. We wanted to fit in a lot in the short time that we had this morning, and partly because there's so much richness and complex complexity of perspectives around this issue, and that we wanted to bring in stakeholders, starting with women working in these jobs, to civil society, government leaders, and of course, the corporations that are the, doing the work to make these changes for their employees. So thank you to all and to our participants for joining in this collective idea that change is achievable and we will do it together. 
And of course, that there's more work to do. And so what I will close with are a few calls to action um, from all of us. Um, first is to business. Um, you know, I, I, a big theme is that we need a transparency revolution in the private sector, particularly in relation to corporate gender data. And, you know, we ask that you embrace the World Benchmarking Alliance's gender benchmark and learn from it as you align your practices. Uh, as we heard from almost every speaker, greater transparency on these issues is essential to making the invisible visible and truly making impact. And from the UN Foundation, um, please consider joining the growing group of companies making public commitments to gender equity and workplace women's health and empowerment. If you are interested, um, details on all of this will be sent out in a follow-up email um, so you can learn more and we'll have more opportunities to announce these types of public commitments. The second is to governments. We look forward to your continued support and assistance in advancing a decade of disclosure amongst businesses by introducing gender reporting requirements to ensure that gender equality is at the heart of any type of pandemic recovery. And the third, um, and I, I think a big part of the audience today is to civil society. We will continue to work with governments and businesses and to hold everyone to account on gender transformative approaches that are truly centered on the needs of individuals and their priorities. And as Anu and Vanita reminded us, I mean, their hard work challenges and their ambitions, it's just two of the women of the many tens of million uh, millions of women who work in global supply chains. And so um, I'll be keeping their voice at the forefront of our next steps. And I hope that you all will too. So with that, uh, we close our event and thank you to everyone and onward together. <laughs>